Hello and welcome to the EMC Live Roundtable, Elephants in the Test Room. My name is Belinda Stachukevich and I'm the editor of Interference Technology, the creator of EMC Live. What you see on your screen is a cartoon by Tom Mullineau. Just some entertainment before we begin. Then I'm going to do my intro. EMC Live is a brand new online three-day event hosted by Interference Technology. Featuring practical information and topics, this event will include roundtables, webinars, and videos on everything EMC related, and there's no cost to attend. Join us for our other webinars this week, and roundtables too. This roundtable is moderated by Tom Mullineau. Panelists include Patrick Andre, Steve Koster, Finn O'Connor, and Adi Neshidam. Author and RF engineer, uh, Tom Mullineau has been in the EMC industry for two, 20 years, both as a supplier to the industry and as a hands-on program manager, achieving EMC compliance for new products. This roundtable is one of many. To check out our others, visit emclive2014.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website. This roundtable will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill out the type box and hit send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or report an issue, click the hand icon. We will discuss the topic for 30 minutes. Now Tom will kick off the roundtable. Thank you, Belinda, and welcome to our audience out there. Now this is a very short time, 30 minutes for three topics, so uh, Belinda will be in charge of the stopwatch and one minute before our 10 minutes is up for each one, she'll be given the, that one minute warning. However, the distinguished panel of experts are at liberty to expand on their views as guest bloggers on the Interfering Technologies blog, EMC Zone, so look out for that. For those unfamiliar, I'll start by stating what an elephant in the test room is. It is a questionable sometimes scandalous test situation that many in the EMC industry know about, but few openly discuss. Which leads nicely into our first elephant, poor EMC measurement consistency. No one is surprised when a round-robin test shows multiple EMC test house measurements taken under supposedly identical test conditions or up to 10 dB apart. By its nature, the ISO 17025 laboratory accreditation standard covers a very broad church of laboratory types. However, the EMC industry is a distinct, identifiable niche. The various compliance groups providing the audit service should be able to work together to improve inter-EMC laboratory measurement accuracy. Can the EMC industry work with ISO 17025 laboratory accreditation teams to improve measurement accuracy? There's a question. Now I'd like to set the scene here. I like to look at situations from an outsider looking in because those fully immersed in the EMC industry often have their vision skewed in my view. So let's take the situation we have a, a new intern joining NIST and the scientists in the lab are wondering well what can we give him as a project and then they, they've got six months to fill this guy's time and then one of the scientists remember remembers having a lunch with a a senior IEEE EMC society member, Bob Scully or another, and it just got mentioned in passing by Bob that wouldn't it be nice to have a, a standard cell for emissions testing, where a standard cell is where you can pretty much calibrate a, a voltmeter because it's always going to be 1.26 volts. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, an equivalent thing for um, fuel testing? So this in turn is, is given the quest of creating an in free space single spot frequency 0.01 volts per meter 10 meter source of and controlled and all the work. This is going to be the perfect thing that the best that NIST can, put, can provide. So six months later he takes it to the local EMC test house all excited and the test house set it up in the OATS test setup. They line up the antenna with the EUT, this perfect source, and they switch on the equipment and he's very impatient and excited and he says well, what do you get? Then they begin to tell him, well, actually, we do have to do a height scan all the way down, take it to one meter above the floor, to four meters above the floor. And he is somewhat flabbergasted. He knows that with at only one meter above the, the fully conductive sheet, that there's going to be a low, a low frequency issue. He knows, because he's a, as an EM engineer, electromagnetic engineer, he's taking his doctorate in, that there's going to be phase inversion at the point where the, uh, the reflecting plane for the second path for the, uh, from the source. And he knows that his perfect radiation pattern, it took so long to get absolute perfect, 
it's now compromised. He's starting to look over the shoulders of the test staff at the test house. He's wondering if it's on candid camera. Steve, you're privy to an ongoing round robin study that is looking to address repeatability between test houses. As such, you are staring this elephant in the face. So Steve, where is the intern from NIST getting it all wrong? Well, that's a good question, Tom. Um, as part of the round robin, we ended up being <clears throat> one of several different laboratories that had a, a specific artifact that we were testing. And some of the data that was returned showed, showed especially down in the low and like 30 megahertz, the, the readings were as much as 45 dB apart. There's some 30 dB high, some 15 dB low of uh, the center. It was it, it was a very big eye opener. Um, really, there wasn't any. It's hard to go back and and find out why that is because all of the laboratories are uh, anonymous. But um, suffice it to say there are some ideas out there that, that what was happening. For example, all BICON antennas have uh, have a side of the antenna that's supposed to be pointing down to the ground plane. If you're not paying attention and you flip that around, you can get different answers. So, uh, you know, EMC testing has a lot of attention to detail, and if it's not there, sometimes you get these large swings. Okay. But, but where is he getting it wrong? The, again, there's so many variables. It's it's really difficult to say. Now, the this he's if if he's trying to make something that you have a direct line of sight on, when we do an actual test, we do do we do change the antenna height one to four meters in order to get the highest reflection. So maybe he wasn't paying attention to the reflections off of the ground plane. Well, it wasn't in his remit in fairness to him, he just thought he wanted to produce a standard cell for RF, right. for RF emissions. That's that's possible. Um, it's hard to, you know, because because there are so many variables, it's, uh, you know, if you're going to be in a chamber as opposed to an out oats, there's really a lot of, a lot of difficulty in um, getting them the same results. Because um. So you, you, you're saying it's, it's, it's pretty much the, the, the worst cases at the lower frequency. So, so, Adi, let me ask you a question then. Why is it that accurate lower frequency measurements are more difficult to take than higher frequency measurements? Tom, I, that is due to the various factors. One is the um, when the sites are qualified um, uh, for uh, MSA, um, in my opinion, they're only catered for cableless products, which means that the radiation, they assume that radiation is coming from a, a, a device that doesn't have any cables, like an antenna. Mm -hmm. The reason is that when they do the NSA measurement, they dress all the cables going to the transmitter and receive antennas with ferrites, and also they put place a 6 dB attenuator at the input ports of the antenna. So they're trying to factor out the cables and so forth, and so it's only the antennas that are that playing a part. Is that the idea? Yeah. So okay. the sites are never qualified for cable products. That means if you are placing a floor standing equipment or if you are placing a tabletop with lots of cables, it's basically not meant for that particular site at all. The site attenuation you think about the plus minus 4 dB variation uh, with the standard NSA, that is not correct for the cable with products with cables. Okay. The I second thing is that uh, the RX antenna that is used uh, during the test is different from that is used for NSA. As Steve okay. mentioned that if you are not positioning or placing the antenna properly with respect to the ground plane, uh, its impedance changes, its coupling changes, and its response changes. Hey guys, calibration Oops. factors that sorry Adi, you, you got about a for, uh, minute left. Uh, Go ahead Adi. Oh, the calibration fa factors that are used or derived or measured using a site uh, method. So, oh. That is one of the, it's not a fixed calibration. As you 
move the antenna along one to four meter scan, the caliber, the antenna performance changes actually. Exactly. So exactly. antenna performance with the uh, ground reflection and trans, I mean direct ray, these two, all three things together, you, you have a mix of uh, performance that you're coming out and you're applying a, a constant antenna factor to that. And in the meantime, there is no constant antenna factor because it's changing with time. Exactly. The yeah. third thing is that the cable attached to the RX antenna, I don't know how many labs provide dressing exactly like they did in during the site attenuation. And sometimes, if they are not dressed properly with ferrites, uh, when the cable touches, sometimes it touches the ground depending on the scan height, its impedance changes actually. Yeah. I've heard stories where people are then, just by moving the cable slightly, they get vastly different emission measurements. So it's, it's known as a badly behaved RF system. That's, that's what you're looking at there. You've got high impedance points that are prone to even the hand coming within a foot of it and that sort of thing. But I must stop you there because it's, we've run out of time for that topic number one. Let's go on to elephant, elephant number two. Thanks, Ed. This, this one is to do with underperforming EMC chambers. When calibrating a test field to, to 6 GHz for the commercial RF immunity testing, to obtain a compliant test field, many test houses are finding they are forced to point the antenna at one corner of the room. All standard 3 meter semi anechoic test chambers are cuboids with flat walls, ceiling and floor. The four walls and the ceiling are clad in RF absorber. The hot wall, that is the one behind the calibration plane and that gets hit by the emissions from the antenna, perform the same as the other three walls. Is a flat absorber lined hot wall, tr wall truly the only possibility? Now, I, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a situation with a brand new chamber with brand new absorber and I was uh, uh, trying to get a compliant field to um, 6 gigahertz and I found the same problem. You've got the situation that with this perfect brand new absorber, it hasn't deteriorated any Somehow or other, it's still seeing the back wall and wrecking the calibration plane. And so I started wondering, well, why on earth is it fact the first place? Isn't that the worst case? Isn't that a case where you, you're going to get, let's say you're, you're at one particular frequency, your absorber is underperforming, well, it's going to go, go through there, it's going to hit the back wall and come straight back at you again. Because although it's a nicely taper matched to hit the wall, it's also a nicely tapered match to come straight back at the calibration plane. So I wonder well, why, why if, if, if you put the antenna at an angle, well, why isn't the uh, back wall all, already angled to take this into account instead of guessing and, and just going there, uh, finding this thing that uh, empirically? And I kind of suspect it's to do with ease of construction. And we all know what that means. That means ease, that means ease of price too. People will pay extra for a, a better chamber is my suspicion. And I see a problem in the, um, these. These, we've just been talking about the oat sites and the four meter scan. I think the chambers are artificially high just so that a chamber manufacturer can claim equivalence with oats. And I, I, I'm not that much enamored of oats as a standard anyway. And I would, myself, I would trade the extra height for oats equivalents for a superior hot wall. What are your thoughts on that thing? Surprise you then, huh? <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> the uh, I, I'm not really sure how to, to approach this answer because the rooms, the the design of the rooms for let's say the military testing um, is is really uh, we try not to angle or do we try to angle our antennas away from the uh, straight on either the piece of equipment that we're testing because not only is the room a a problem. It's the actual piece of equipment you're testing. If you're, especially doing a, a susceptibility test or an immunity test, if you're aiming right at the device, uh, you could have reflection right back to your uh, transmitting antenna. Uh, same thing with you. Well, with your receive antenna, you want to see exactly right at the, uh, let's say, bore side of the antenna. Uh, but you certainly don't want the room to be a, uh, a contributor. So we try to uh, have it lined with the ferrite material and then with the anechoic on top of that to try to reduce that as much as possible. As far as the angle of the walls, I mean that could you could certainly make complex uh, walls, but the cost then would go probably extremely high. And I think that would probably one of the reasons that 
we don't see these complex designed rooms. Uh, well, uh, actually, I've just created an article for Interference Technology for the European Guide on that very, very point. And I would argue that there is a scope for improvement. Andre, any thoughts on this? Patrick, sorry. <laughs> I, I pretty much agree with what's being said here. The the fact that the room construction is going to be a bit uh, more costly is an issue. However, it is being done for things like reverberation chambers where you, as much as possible, want to stir these modes. The other thing, too, is anechoic material is not a perfect absorber, and especially if you're using cones and not using ferrites. Cones don't work well at low frequency. So you have to end up... Uh, uh, um, realizing that you're going to get some transmission through the cone off the wall and back at you. It's going to be if some sort of compromise, that's what you're saying. You're exactly. You're going to get it perfect. Yeah. Right, right. Unless you make the cone huge. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, cone, yeah. But then the, the tips have to touch in the center of the room in order for them to work at the resonant frequency of the room. So. Well, I made this proposal in, within, within the article and uh, I've been fortunate enough that um, CST have loaned me a copy of their CST studio suite and that is ideal for doing this exactly that sort of thing. You can actually make the imperfect uh, uh, pyramidal uh, block, you can have the reflecting um, wall behind it, and you can have uh, field probes or, uh, uh, and at very little expense. I, I think I'll be able to answer my own question as, as to whether there is little, little expense in terms of me just typing in at the keyboard, whether there is scope for improvement that maybe is not too cost prohibitive. I submit that you bring in a panel that's a, uh, a maybe a metal panel that you can roll around the room behind the, the unit and just put it at an obscure angle. And now you've got a non-parallel wall that you've got behind the, the unit. And you can start that's stirring. That's an excellent things. idea because that sounds low cost, comparatively low cost. You may have questions on repeatability. You put it in exactly the right spot every time. That's an excellent idea. You mean it's a, a roll-in chamber modifier, modifier, hot wall modifier, I suppose. Yeah, we used to use them in the early days of uh, susceptibility testing be when we couldn't afford to coat an entire room with anechoic material. We'd roll in these panels of anechoic material. Oh, cool, cool. Now, talking about anechoic material, people are voting with their feet, and um, for a lower frequency test, you always had the fully reflecting floor, which contributed to the test. But now, people are voting with their feet, and uh, for up to 1 gigahertz, you see invariably that they have some sort of absorber between the antenna and the EUT. Uh, the best ones I've seen was actually from uh, ETS Lindgren, where you, they actually they were heavy, and it was a two-man push. It was a, a big square meter. Uh, on casters, and it had the ferrite tile on neatly in, uh, fastened onto the pallet, and then on top of that was the the pyramidal absorber, and you put those in one meter blocks between the EUT and between the um, antenna, and that made a big big difference as you can imagine, which almost takes you straight back to the Oak's question: What on earth is that fully reflecting plane doing there in the first place? Is there another way around that? If you're going to take that as your industry standard. Uh, the perfect thing that everything else is referenced to. Just let you guys go. Yep, you have about one more minute on this topic. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, almost at the end, well, uh, I'll be able to give more input and please look out in the blog and look out for what the, uh, the experts have to say in, in the blog too. But I, I, I will be publishing the results of the CST uh, modeling on the blog site and let's see if there is scope. And maybe maybe I'll go with that one. That's an excellent idea of having a portable, portable angled reflector. You probably want to um, have the pyramidal uh, blocks still aiming at the antenna, so you'd have to angle those somewhat, so you'd have to talk to a supplier or absorber as to whether they would be willing to cut that plane so that, that, that you, you still got a good performance in terms of absorption. But uh, my final on word on this is I would happily trade the extra expense of being able to do a four meter high um, scan for oats equivalents for a, a superior performing hot wall, whether you roll it in or you don't roll it in. Which brings us to elephant number three. Automotive tests that put the car audio system performance first. 
until fairly recently, it seemed the RF immunity tests conducted inside the car cabin space were purely to ensure good sound system performance. Now, I got that from the horse's mouth. There's, there's some guys ahead of the EMC in very major car, man, car manufacturers, and they uh, openly admitted, yes, any testing that was done in the past inside the car cabin in terms of immunity with a one screaming around it was invariably at the dashboard and it was invariably to make sure there's no crackling sounds or deterioration in the hi-fi system in the car. Now we've got this situation now that you, the, the, the cars full of uh, cables, data cables and so forth and all, all sorts of artificial antennas going into the car and then you've got all these common threats, cell phones and others, intentional radiators it seems to be becoming more and more prolific and it, it, no one would be surprised if there weren't four or five common threats all together at one time in the, in the space of a car in real life conditions. How would you set about testing in terms of uh, uh, the capabil capability to withstand those threats from inside the cabin? We all know it's done full vehicle, but how much of that leaks into the how much that actually leaks into the cabin itself. And of course, it in no way, reflect, in no way it pretends to be uh, an internal threat, particularly if it's pro uh, close proximity to a soft spot in the wiring, in the peripherals on that wiring. Some kid plays there, walkie-talkie down there or something real close to it. How, how would you set about testing against threats from within the cabin of a car? Patrick. You first, please. I, I would go to my aerospace routes and come up with what we call a rig test, where you model the dash uh, against a metal background uh, that would represent the dash inside the, uh, the, the car. You could bring that into a testing laboratory and transmit directly at the inside of this thing and see what sort of susceptibility you're going to cause uh, to the test equipment or to the uh, the equipment uh, uh, on the on the car. Um, th those sort of things tend to be quite realistic, and yet you don't have to try to put an antenna inside a Volkswagen at that point. You can you can actually have a, a, a full testing laboratory where you can perform a full immunity test over the whatever range you want to do. Yeah, I can see. That, that, that makes a lot of sense for one thing. When you're talking about a, a cockpit, there's only just about enough room for the pilot and everything else is kind of surrounded and it's very, very local. For all we know, it could be the, the back space of the cabin. You know, you see what I'm saying? Where there's a lot more space inside a car than there is inside, say, a cockpit. And, and would, I can see you wheel in some mock-up of the, the dashboard and then you irradiate that, fair enough, but how would that irradiate other areas of the cabin? You, okay, you, you might take a, a whole block of the, of the, the, the weakness away by saying, okay, the uh, dashboard is immune, but what about something further back where some designer in his wisdom put some sort of microprocessor control thing very close to the rear seat? How would you pick that up? Um, I, I, you know, I suppose it's the same sort of way. It doesn't need to be against metal. It could just be brought in as all its cables and components into the, the testing laboratory. But a, a, another thing I, w I would recommend in a situation like that is below 400 megahertz, you can usually replicate radiated fields by doing a conducted immunity or conducted susceptibility test and actually inject those currents on to the wires that are leading to whatever components you're you're interested in. Now, for cellular frequencies, that's not going to work. However, for cellular frequencies, you can your antennas are now small enough that maybe you can bring them inside the the car and transmit inside the car, turn it into a little reverberation chamber, and see what happens. Yeah, I've got some thoughts on that. But first, Steve, what's what's your input to this? Huh? It's, 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 the, the situation in, to me is deteriorating. Things are getting worse, and um, so how, how could the EMC industry be proactive and say, "Okay, let's get a lead on this"? And how well, do we how do we replicate that threat inside the company? It, it's difficult, but um, everyone I've dealt with in automotive, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, 
doing the things at the component or at, or at their system level. Uh, the standard's pretty explicit that you try to make sure that you have the right cabling and things like that. And, and as Patrick said, we bring it into the lab and we run through the, you know, we are able to control running through the entire frequency band and watching the unit to make sure it doesn't have any susceptibilities. And tuning it to different test levels, etc. Now, if all of the um, all of the subsystems then are taken care of, then at the at the final system level, hopefully that gives them some uh, form of of. It's an of, indication only, though, isn't it? There's no guarantees, right. there's, there's no guarantees. There's never any guarantees. And there's no second test. There's no second test in that you get the full vehicle, but does that really illuminate the cabin sufficiently? Some of those, uh, the fields that they have, especially um, at some of the labs I've been to up in Michigan, are so intense that it does have to be illuminating the cabin quite a bit. Um, so there, I mean, they're really working hard at it, but um, I think the original question had to do with is using just sound, uh, the sound of the high Wi-Fi or the hi-fi system adequate and no longer is that adequate because of all of the circuitry and all of the microprocessors on board now, they really have to pay attention to all of the systems and their functions in order to make sure it's safe. So, so Finn, what do you think? Is there a, is there a way? I mean, I've got an idea too with that. Well, I, mean, I, I, I don't have that, you know, your idea may be some kind of neat little way of going about it, but what both Ann Patrick and uh, Steve have said is, I think we, we come a little from the military side and looking at just an airplane, if I'm testing an airplane, I'm going to test parts that are going to go on the airplane, then they're going to test the whole airplane. And the idea there is we're going to make sure over the full frequency range that this device can, can work in the environment. Then when they install it on the aircraft, now we're checking the installation to make sure that hasn't been disrupted some way from what we did in the lab on each individual piece of equipment. As far as the inside the uh, the, the, the car. Uh, I've done some testing years ago. We did some testing for uh, police and, uh, and, and fire departments, and we saw some pretty hellacious fields inside the car from uh, walkie-talkies. Uh, this was really kind of before cell phones were big, so it was many walkie-talkies, which are a little more powerful than cell phones, or at least most of the time they are. Um, and there were some pretty crazy, uh, you know, residences that happened inside the car. So I think that maybe a, a good bit of measurement inside the car would be required first to say what levels are they are possible inside, you know, inside the car before we go and dump a lot of energy on these systems because most of the systems for mil for the automotive industry are tested to pretty high field strengths up to the 100 volt per meter plus. So generating that kind of field strength inside the you know the cabin with just a cell phone that's not going to be that easy. So. A lot of times the testing is catching a lot of those potential problems in there as far as the electronics are concerned. Yeah. I understand what you're saying that you, you over-test the components themselves in the hope that once they're all together inside the car and someone brings in some new threat that we don't know about yet, and um, it, it could still misbehave. But to, to, to me, I still think there's a, a, a hole in the overall EMC test plan for, for all the mode. In, in the, but see, so how would I say about it? It's straight off the top of my head. Um, you know you've got a cell phone, you know it's a tri-band or quad-band or whatever it is, you take each one of those bands and instead of just having a spot frequency or some simple modulation, you actually, I mean nowadays you, the way you test um, an RF uh, power amplifier used in cell phones, you know, like in the base station and so forth, you give it a real uh, waveform of whatever, 2G, 3G, 4G, upcoming 5G, whatever it is, and I would set it at 10 times the level you could ever expect, let's say 10 watts, and I'd have a standard sweep. Now, here's another thing. It's, it's the, the automotive guys, they know pretty well where the soft spots are too. They know that, hey, this is running a bit close to here, and if, if someone should put a, an intentional transmitter by accident down the back of the seat, then it could see quite a few. The, the, the part of the test plan could include the identified spots, the soft spots, and it could be that the automotive insist on the, of their new car designers that they list the soft spots, that is, they're, they're, they're liable to, uh, um, susceptible to interference from, from these threats. But uh, getting back to how I said about it, I'd have ones of different sorts because you don't want to hurt yourself, and I'd, I'd, I'd sweep it around wh wherever the soft spots are, and, and particularly the dash, of course, and I'd have it at 10 times 
the emitted threat and I'm sweet the sweet the cabin. Would it still be perfect? No. Is it better? Would it fill the hole that we have somewhat now where we over test components then hope they work together when they're inside the cabin? Uh, probably not entirely, but it would be a good start where what I'm basically saying is you actually introduce the real threat and not a spot frequency supposedly being close to that threat. Hi, Tom. I just wanted to jump in, um, let you know that we just have about a minute to wrap up here. Okay. Well, um, please, everyone, all the audience out there, uh, the, the we guest bloggers uh, in um, EMC zone, so, uh, and they were expanding on their views there and the encounter one or two of my views. And um, also look out there because I am modeling some of these issues using the CST Studio Suite. And that's going to be, that's a very powerful tool. It might be able to give some, some of the answers here. And so signing off and handing over back to you, Belinda. I hope everyone enjoyed our, our discussion. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, everyone. Um, we'd like to have a call for final questions from uh, the audience. Uh, if you send us questions to info at emclive2014.com, we'll pass them along to the panel and they can answer the questions. And make sure you check out our blog, emc-zone.com, and you'll see some uh, discussion on there for sure. Um, I'd like to end this discussion today by asking our experts a final question. Um, experts. How many more elephants are still out there? Enough to fill Noah's Ark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, and thank you thank for you. attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.